Okay, guys. Um, so as I said, the end of class last time, all we've got left to do this um, in class is chapter 19. And I actually think that we can finish chapter 19 today, um, which means um, Monday is a holiday. And uh, so, which is kind of unfortunate because it's just kind of thrown in the middle of our mini semester. And uh, so I think what we'll do on Tuesday, and I'll send an email out to remind y'all as well. I think on Tuesday, rather than uh, having class, I will just have office hours from 10 to 11. So you'll join the regular old class Zoom link, like always, if you want to come in for office hours. Um, so that's only if you have any kinds of questions over uh, the previous quizzes that have been turned in or um, about the final exam. So, um, and I'll remind y'all again at the end of the class because not quite everybody's added on here. Um, so, We'll finish up today and on Tuesday, office hours from 10 to 11. And that's only if you need to come in and ask questions or um, get any kind of help, then I will be available for an hour on Tuesday during class time, 10 to 11. Okay, so let's move forward with chapter 19 and finishing up our material. Um, <clears throat> so chapter 19, uh, we're moving into trade. We've kind of touched on trade a little bit, trade among um, you and your roommate, um, and a little bit of trade with comparative advantage. Uh, now we're gonna take what we've done with our comparative advantage and with our uh, production possibility frontiers, and we're going to put it all together. Uh, so um, the law of comparative advantage, we've seen this several times now, tells us that each country should specialize in the goods for which they have the lowest opportunity cost, um, which means the goods in which they have a comparative advantage. <clears throat> So um, I have updated the slides. Uh, I update them every year um, that show um, what we are importing and exporting. Uh, so the things that we are exporting are things that we have a comparative advantage in. The things that we import are the things that we do not have a comparative advantage in. So. Um, the latest data that I've looked at shows that the things that we export, uh, that our number one export currently is food and beverages. Um, and this uh, makes complete sense because um, the United States, the whole middle of the country, um, you know, flyover country that the press calls it, is excellent for producing food. And so um, we are blessed with rich, wonderful land and lots of it for producing food. And so even though we are um, technologically advanced, we are still really good at food production. Our number two export is crude oil. Uh, number three, we do a lot of technology products, so aircraft, and engines for aircraft. Uh, number four, automobile parts. And number five, industrial machines, which are uh, industrial means machine, the types of machines you would use in a factory. So capital equipment is what we're talking about there. So those are the things that, um, oh, I said four and I put five on the list. So five exports that we have. What do we import? The things that we do not have a comparative advantage in. Uh, cars, computers, 
um, computers and, and consumer electronics in general. Medical supplies, uh, that's a new thing added to the list since COVID. Uh, number four is um, broadcasting equipment. I think that moved up on the list also due to COVID um, because not only did, um, did professionals need broadcasting equipment, but businesses uh, with the increase in teleconferencing and Zoom and working from home, we all needed more equipment like that. And we import crude oil. So we export crude oil and we import crude oil. So when I've described oil and gas um, in the previous chapters, I acted like it was all the same. It's not quite all the same. And so there are different um, kinds of oil. And um, so we export ours and import others because there are different things about the, the oil. All right. And our largest trading partners, this is probably going to surprise you guys a little bit. Um, our largest, um, our, the most of our exports go to Canada. Canada is our number one trading partner if you look at back and forth trade between the two countries. And we export more to Canada than any other country. Um, we have always had free trade with Canada. You know, they, they occupy a huge part of our border. And uh, so we've always had free trade and we've always enjoyed a really good trade relationship with Canada. Uh, number two now is Mexico. And um, in 1994, uh, Congress passed the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And that made trade between Canada, the US, and Mexico um, all uh, barrier free. Um, and so we have all free trade between our three countries as of 1994. And so Mexico has become a really important trading partner to us as well. Uh, number three is China. China usually gets knocked as being an exporting country, but not an importing country. Uh, that is not true anymore. Uh, China imports quite a, quite a bit. So we export a lot to China as well. Uh, number four is Japan, five Great Britain, six Germany. So those are our um, big trading partners that we export to. Who do we import from? This probably won't surprise you. Number one is China because um, we import so many consumer electronics from China. Uh, two is Mexico, three is Canada. Mexico and Canada kind of switch back and forth a lot. Um, number four, Japan, five, Germany, six, South Korea. That's gonna be a lot of those cars that we see. South Korea, as their economy has become uh, more highly technical, um, has, has improved on our trading partner list. All right. So, um, oh, back to the list just for a minute. I will say that um, because we import so much from China, um, China is our largest trade deficit partner. We import a lot more from China than um, we export to China. So we call that a trade deficit. And um, we have our largest trade deficit with China. So they are a huge important trading partner. Okay. So um, let's move back into that world of production possibility frontiers. Um, and we're going to put it together with trade. And so um, we're gonna look at two countries, the United States and Izadia. And we're doing PPF, so that means two goods. Um, and so we're gonna do food, 
and clothing as our two goods. All right, the US has half as many workers as Izadia. 100 million in the US, 200 million in Izadia. So we have half the number of workers, but Izadia is poorer than the United States. And that means the workers are less educated. They have less capital to work with and their land is less fertile, not as good, okay? And so um, we're gonna kind of be answering the question here, can we trade um, and, and gain in trades by trading with a poorer country? All right, so here is our PPF table for the United States. Um, because we have two countries, we're gonna have two separate PPF tables and two separate PPF curves. All right, um, and so if you look at this one, even though resources are not completely adaptable between food and clothing, look at our numbers here. If we completely specialize in food, United States can produce 600 food. And every time we give up 120 food, we get 60 clothing. So we give up from 600 to 480, that's 120 food we're giving up and we're gaining 60 clothing. As we move from 480 to 360, we're giving up another 120 in food and gaining another 60. And that goes all the way to the end of the PPF where at the end we are zero food, all clothing, okay? So this is, we're gonna um, put this on paper as a straight line PPF, okay? It's not really, but it's gonna make our analysis a lot cleaner looking if we do it this way. Oops, sorry guys. Um, so we're gonna do a straight line PPF here. So completely specialized in food, 600, completely specialized in clothing, 300. All right, so let's go look at Izadia. Okay, if Izadia completely specializes in food, um, we'll have 200 food, no clothing. And if you'll notice, we've got another straight line PPF. Um, Izadia loses 40 food and gains 80 clothing. So we give up from 160 to 120, we give up 40 food and they gain 80 to 160, another 80 clothing. Okay, so another straight line PPF for every 40 food they give up, they gain 80 clothing. All right, so we can already see that the United States has an absolute advantage in food because if the United States only does food, they can make 600. If Izadia only does food, they can only make 400. So US has an absolute advantage in food. What about clothing? Izadia on the end point there, if they completely specialize in clothing, can make 400. Well, I, I kind of want y'all to say Izadia has the, compare, the uh, absolute advantage, but it's not really true. And the reason it's not true, yes, they can produce 400 and the US only produces 300, but notice it takes them 200 million workers to produce that 400. It only takes us 100 million workers to produce 300. So per worker, we're better at both. The United States has a, a, um, an absolute advantage in both if you turn the output to output per worker. Are y'all with me there kind of? Okay, all right. So um, 
I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the document camera at this point. Um, okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take um, the United States and I'm going to draw their um, PPF curve. And then I'm going to draw Izadia's PPF curve. I'm going to do them side by side. This is my red pen. I don't know why it looks so orange on the camera, but I was doing red for the United States. So I guess it's now orange for the US. Okay, remember it doesn't matter where we put food and clothing. And so if the US completely specializes in food, we'll have 600 food. If they completely specialize in clothing, we'll have 300 clothing. And so we just have a straight line PPF for them, for the US. <coughs> All right, so Izadia. I'm gonna put it right next to the first one. And I'm gonna make sure my food and clothing are on the same axes. Okay, and if they completely specialize in food, they get 200 food, completely specialize in clothing, they get 400 clothing. And not bad, not bad drawing there. Okay. So I've got our initial PPFs for both countries. Um, I'll come back to this in just a second. We are going to start with the assumption that both our countries are in what's known as autarky. Um, autarky is where we are completely self-sufficient. And um, the country either cannot or will not engage other countries in um, trade. So there's no trade under autarky. And um, if that is the case, then what we're calling the PPF is also our CPF, our consumption possibility frontier. Okay. If they can't trade or won't trade, they can only consume different combinations of food and clothing that they produce themselves. If they won't trade, they can only consume combinations of food and clothing that they produce themselves. So this PPF is also our CPF, Consumption Possibilities Frontier Without Trade. So that's under autarky or no trade. Now, let's see how we do with some trade. So let's go back to the document camera. <coughs> All right, and so what we need to do is we need to calculate our opportunity costs. So we're gonna stick with the US on the left. 
Isadia on the right there. Okay, and we're gonna set our endpoints equal to one another. So 600 food or, and we can do this quite easily because it's a straight line PPF. So this trade, um, what we're about to figure out these opportunity costs will be constant along the line. Okay. And now I wanna get it in terms of one food and one clothing. So I'm gonna divide both sides by 300 and I'll get one clothing equals two food. So the opportunity cost of producing one clothing in the United States is they give up two food. Every time they produce one clothes, they give up two food. And every time they give up one food, they gain one clothing or half a clothing, sorry, half the clothing. Okay. And over here in the United States, I mean, in Izadia, do the same thing. We're going to set our two endpoints equal to one another. So 200 food is equal to 400 clothing in Izadia. Divide both sides by 200 so that we get one food is equal to two clothes. Every time Izadia gives up a food, they get two clothing. Every time they give up a clothing, they get half of food. Okay. That's just like we did last time. So we're combining our PPFs and our um, opportunity costs together now. Okay. So let's see if there's any room for trade. We're gonna compare one clothing to one clothing and one food to one food. Okay, so US gives up two food to produce a clothing. Izadia gives up half a food. Who should produce clothing? Yeah, Izadia, Izadia is giving up only half a food to produce that clothes, whereas the U.S. gives up two full foods. So Izadia has the comparative advantage in producing clothing. And now compare one food to one food. US gives up half a clothing to produce a food. Isadia gives up two whole clothes to produce a food. So US is giving up less clothes to produce food. US has the comparative advantage. So now we're gonna have the US specializing in food and Izadia specializing in clothing. Okay. So up here, I'm gonna circle, we're gonna specialize in food here and clothing here in Izadia. All right, now we need to decide we're gonna pretend like this is a barter country, a barter situation. We're not gonna use money. We're gonna trade food for clothing, okay? No money. Trade food for clothes. So we need to come up with a terms of trade. A terms of trade is just how much food 
trades for how much clothing, okay? And that terms of trade needs to make both countries better off, okay? So the U.S. is producing food, and if they give up a food, they can already produce half a clothes on their own, okay? So they're gonna want more than half a close if they're gonna give up some food for trade, right? Because they can do half on their own. So if they're gonna give up a whole food, they want more than half a close for it. And over here, same thing for Izadi. If they're, they can produce half a food on their own if they give up a close. So if they give up a close, they're gonna want more than half a food. So what if we trade one for one? Then the U.S. gets an extra, an extra half a close and Izadia gets an extra half of food for every food or clothing they give up. So we're gonna go ahead and set the terms of trade at one for one. And if we do that, uh, both countries will be better off. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we wanna see what we can buy from the other country, okay? So we're gonna start with Izadia. All right, so Izadia. Buys food. from the US, right? Okay, so here's the deal, guys. Izadia has 400 clothes to trade away. So here's how it's going to work. Izadia could keep all 400 of their clothes and buy zero food. So they are well-dressed, but hungry and skinny. They're all fashion models over here, well-dressed, skinny, and hungry. All right, now they'd like a little bit of food. So they could do trade away one clothing and buy one food. Or they could trade away two, two clothing and have two food or three clothing to have three food and we could keep going through every number, dot, 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 until we got down to, um, now they are down to like um, four clothing left, but they are now buying um, 396 food, three clothing, 390, seven food, two, one. They could trade away all their clothing and buy up to 400 food. Y'all see what I'm doing there? So I'm just going, okay, trade away a little bit of clothing, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Keep buying more and more food, less and less clothing. And what we would end up with is, look, here's our endpoints, 400 clothing with zero food. Or on the other end, we have zero clothing and they bought all food. Now they're naked and well-fed. 
chubby and naked is not the way to go. All right, so. What we have now is a new consumption possibility frontier. Where now they can purchase on this new black line. This is their CPF with trade. Well, anything on this line except the endpoint is better than anything on the old line. Anything on this line means they're getting more than from the old line, right? So this is an illustration of how the trade is benefiting Izodia. Do y'all all see that? Y'all are seeing it. Okay. So now let's go look at the United States. All right, so the United States is going to buy clothes from Izadia. Because right now the United States has 600 food, no clothes. So again, they are well fed, but naked. That's not good. So we wanna get some clothes in the United States. And so they start with 600 food and zero clothes. That's where they are. They could trade away a food to buy one clothes. That's not gonna get them very far with 100 million citizens. Um, They could trade some more and buy two clothes. We could keep going. We could go all the way to, let's see, we get 300 food and 300 clothes. That's on this line that we're doing. And we keep going. Uh, we go to where we are at. Um, let's see, uh, 201 food, which means we bought, um, 399 clothing, 200 food. We've bought 400 clothing. Can we keep going? Okay, I'm seeing William and Corbin on my screen right now and they're both telling me no. Why can't I keep going? Anybody? Yeah, Izadia has nothing left to trade. At this point, we bought all their clothes. Okay. We can't get to buying 600 clothes because Izadia doesn't make 600 clothes. They only make 400. So if we buy all of Izadia's clothes, all 400, we still have 200 food left over for ourselves. Okay, hopefully everybody's with me out there. So what that means is the farthest we can get is over here to 400. But when we do that, we're still gonna have 200 food left over. I'm gonna put a big old dot right there. This 
dot represents that we have 200 food and we're buying 400 clothing from Izadia. Okay. So now I'm gonna connect my endpoints. And this is my CPF with trade for the United States. It's just left dangling in the air there. Now, if they could produce more clothing, this line would continue down to the clothing axis. But that's all they've got. We've bought it all. Is this line, this new black line that I've drawn here better than the old orange line? Even if it dangles? Yeah, yeah. We are better off in the United States, even though this thing dangles. If we want more clothes, well, we still have 200 food. We can go trade with some other country. Okay, that's not saying Izadi is the only one out there. That's just who we're trading with right now. Okay. But with Izadia, this is as far as we can get. All right. So, um, guys, it's always the rich country that's left dangling because the poor country just can't produce enough. But we can still see that as the rich country of the US, we are still benefiting from this trade. This CPF curve is better than the original CPF curve. Okay. All right. Okay, does everybody see where all of that came from? You have questions, now's the time. So again, um, on your um, last quiz, actually, y'all won't be quizzed on this chapter. You'll only see this material on the final. So I will not be um, asking y'all to draw graphs on the final. Um, so you need to understand how these work uh, because I might draw graphs and ask you to tell me which one works for what, which one applies, okay? But I won't ask you to draw these. Um, so just so you're aware. Yeah, the quiz that you're working on right now, quiz four uh, is the only one that I'll, um, the last time I'll ask y'all to do short answer problems. I'm just happy um, I figured out a way to get y'all to do a little bit of practice with those. Okay, is everybody okay with this then? Okay, it's kind of cool how we were able to put it all together, the, the um, information, and now y'all kind of see why, it, to me, it's just worth it to hold off on that half of chapter two, because it just all makes so much sense. Uh, to put it all together. Okay, so we're gonna go back over to the PowerPoint. Give myself clean paper here. So. All right, so how do countries figure out what they have a comparative advantage in. Um, so some of the things that we do, first of all, we look at our resource endowments. What are our various countries blessed with? So as I told y'all, the United States, we are blessed with beautiful, fertile land and lots of it. And that's why we're such big food producers even though food is not necessarily the most technologically advanced thing we can produce, we have this great land, we're not gonna let it go to waste. Um, so that's why we produce lots of food. 
uh, in the Middle East, they have lots of oil. So they're gonna produce that oil and they're gonna export it to the rest of the world um, because that's what they're blessed with. We happen to be blessed with quite a bit of oil as well. All right, what else do we produce? We produce things in which we have economies of scale. There's a reason why the US and Japan dominated the car market forever. We were kind of the first people in, we developed the big old factories in the US and Japan. And so we already had the economies of scale to continue production. So it's almost like being first in the industry with economies of scale um, helps you it, it stay dominant. Um, and as I said, for South Korea, for Kia and Hyundai to enter the market, they had to have help from the South Korean government. It's been hard for anybody else to compete. And lastly, we produce and trade based upon differences in taste. So here in the United States, we have a really strong taste for coffee. We love coffee here in the United States. That's why there's a million coffee shops. Um, however, we do not have the good, the right climate or the right soil to grow coffee. Um, coffee needs kind of rainforesty with some cool evenings. Um, it tends to be hilly country um, and it's got to maintain a certain temperature. We don't have that. Um, they have that in Central America. And um, thank goodness we can buy coffee that in certain regions of Africa. So, you know, we let Costa Rica produce coffee and we buy it from them and we are grateful to have it because we love it. Um, Algeria has the perfect climate, soil, conditions for growing beautiful grapes. It's hard to export grapes as grapes. So they would like to take advantage of their, um, their grape crop and, and do something with it. So Algeria turns their grapes into wine. Um, it's also hard to store grapes though. So, th so they turn it into wine so they can um, ship, the, ship it and store it. And thank goodness they can sell it to the rest of the world because um, most people in Algeria are um, Muslim and the Muslim faith does not drink alcohol. So if they couldn't sell it to somebody who does have a taste for wine, they'd be in trouble because they couldn't sell all their grapes locally. So they need to be able to trade to somebody who can buy them. All right. Now we've spent a lot of time um, kind of extolling the virtues of free trade, but not everybody is such a fan of free trade. Um, and so uh, we're gonna talk about uh, two kinds of trade restrictions. I'm gonna go into detail on tariffs. I'm just gonna briefly mention quotas. I don't like the way your book did the analysis of quotas. So we're just going to kind of introduce them and leave it at that. So tariffs are taxes on imported goods. Uh, the point of the taxes, it raises the cost of selling to the foreign supplier. They pass the cost on, so it raises the prices to the domestic consumer. So that's the point of tariffs. It's to discourage um, foreigners from selling their products here in the United States. And it's also raising the prices to discourage US consumers from buying it. Um, we have two kinds of tariffs. Uh, actually, there's plenty more, but the two we'll talk about are specific, which is a specific 
dollar amount on a specific quantity. Okay. So a specific tariff would be a $5 a barrel tax on oil. Specific amount specific on a specific quanti uh, quantity. An ad valorem tax is a percent of the value. Uh, value means the selling price. So we're gonna add, so if a, if a Japanese car is selling in the United States for 50,000, we add a tax on it, uh, they're gonna have to increase the price to 55,000 to cover the 10% the tax, okay? So we're gonna look at a specific tariff in our example. All right. So I'm going to just go on to the document camera here. All right, so um, we've talked about the sugar market in the United States before. Um, so let's look at um, tariffs and U.S. sugar market. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the US sugar market. I'm gonna draw it kind of big so I can, you can really see what's going on. There's demand in the US, that is US consumers wanting to buy sugar. Supply here is U.S. firms wanting to produce and sell sugar. Here is what the price in the U.S. would be. The problem is it's not just the U.S. producing sugar. The whole world produces sugar. Well, not the whole world, but uh, again, those Central American countries, uh, the islands, uh, other places around the world, lots of places produce sugar. And um, so, and they all can produce it much more cheaply than we do. So the world price of sugar is way down here, that should be a straight line, which means at the world price of sugar, here's what we have in the United States. This is how much sugar is produced in the United States at the world price. And this is the US consumption of sugar. At the world price. So here's what the US produces. Here's what the US is consuming. The difference here between the two is what we're importing. So this is our US imports at the world price. Okay. Whatever numbers here, maybe this is 100, maybe this is 500, then we would be importing 400 sugar. Y'all with me? So the US sugar farmers who are quite wealthy and influential go to Congress and say, we are being driven out of business. We're not producing very much sugar if we have to sell at this world price. We can't compete against the rest of the world. Please, please Congress help us. And so Congress says, okay, we will add a tariff to sugar. 
And so they do. So we end up with, here's the world price, and then they're gonna add a specific tariff. T equals a specific dollar amount tariff. So now everybody in the United States is gonna charge the extra tariff. The United States farmers are gonna tack that onto their prices and they get to keep the tariff. But the foreign producers are gonna tack that onto their price and they're gonna to have to pay it to the government. So our tariff revenue goes to government. On, on the imports, but the domestic producers, the US sugar producers get to keep the extra tea. Okay, so here's where we are now. Okay. So here's our US sugar production now that we have the tariff, we can see that it's increased. And because the price went up, quantity demanded went down. So here's our consumption with the tariff. Okay, so the US farmers get to produce and sell more. We're gonna buy less and it achieves something that they wanted, the imports decreased. Now it's this much smaller area instead, or, or gap instead of this big gap. Okay. All right, does everybody see what's happened so far? All right, so at the world price, our consumer surplus, I need y'all to kind of look at what I'm doing here. Our consumer surplus is this giant triangle, the area under the demand curve and over the world price. That was our consumer surplus at the world price. Now that we've added the tariff, our consumer surplus is this smaller triangle. It's still pretty nice sized, but we can see A, B, C, and D. Those areas used to be consumer surplus with at the world price, and now they're not with the tariff. A plus B plus C plus D equals consumer surplus lost with the tariff. Are y'all seeing it? Okay. All right, so we wanna know what happened to A, B, C, and D. So we're gonna start with the easiest one. This little box of C. Well, that equals the tariff. And this um, distance from here to here are imports. Tariff times imports, who's getting that? Who's getting the tariff on the imports? Yep, that's our government revenue. All right, from an economic welfare standpoint, this does not hurt the consumers. 
because government revenue, the whole point of the government collecting revenue is they're going to distribute services back to the citizens. So they're gonna take this revenue and they're gonna use it to provide us, the US citizens with services. And so we'll see it again. We've lost it through our purchases of sugar, but we'll, great, we'll regain it through government services. So this is not a loss of economic welfare. This is kind of a wash for the welfare standpoint. All right, now let's see what happened to this kind of odd shape area. A, that's the next easiest. Well, if we divide A into a little A1, A2, this little box that we create for A1 here, that's the extra revenue on everything the government sold before. Because not, not the government, the US producers. The US producers are gonna charge the extra T on everything they were selling. And that's A1. And they get to keep it. Plus, they got to produce, they're producing more. because of the extra tea. It's like adding on to the price for them. So that's that little part A2. So that all together adds up to A. So this is um, basically what happened is, this is a change from consumer surplus to producer surplus. That's what happened to all of A. It was consumer surplus and now it's, oh, sorry, producer surplus. All right, everybody with me still? Okay, and that leaves us with B and D. Okay. It. In paper. So I wanna keep this up here so you're still seeing that. There we go. Okay, so triangle D. Well, guess what that little triangle is? It is a dead weight loss of the tariff because US consumers used to get to buy this extra sugar. Somebody in the world used to get to sell the extra sugar, but now we're not buying it, they're not selling it, nobody gets it. So it's a dead weight loss, okay? And this little triangle B is another dead weight loss 
This one, B, results from, we're not particularly good at producing sugar in the United States, are we? Otherwise, we wouldn't be having trouble competing. We would be able to compete at the world price. We wouldn't need the tariff if we were good at this. Sugar is not our comparative advantage. And now we've told US farmers, hey, produce even more sugar. Use up our valuable resources by producing more sugar that you're not particularly good at producing. So we've just wasted resources encouraging those US producers to do something they're not all that good at. And it creates a deadweight loss. So B plus T equals our deadweight loss of tariffs. So A goes to the producer, C goes to the government, B and D are deadweight losses, B and D are the problems with tariffs. Okay. How does everybody feel about this? Everybody good? Okay, good, like to see that. Okay, so if I gave you a graph, Y'all could figure all this stuff out. If I put numbers everywhere, y'all could figure out what the revenue was, what the imports were. If I give you a labeled graph, um, you could even calculate using your little areas of triangles what the deadweight losses are, all of that stuff. Okay, y'all feel look y'all look confident, guys. I've been saving my notes as we've been going along. And this is how many pages I have of all my notes since the very beginning. It's, it's pretty thick. <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Um, Okay, that's the tariffs. All I'm gonna talk about with quotas is this. Um, a quota is a legal limit on how many we purchase from a certain country. So we might put a quota and say, hey, we'll only take um, a thousand um, sedans from Japan this year. Okay, so we put a limit on a particular country and a particular uh, good that's coming from that country. Um, and so usually they're set, like I said, it, it aims at a different, a certain country and a certain good. Um, so we uh, did see quotas on Japanese vehicles when, um, when they first uh, came out in the 70s. Uh, the, US, um, the US car producers were very threatened by uh, the Japanese vehicles. Uh, mainly because um, that was when oil prices and gas prices were really high and the U.S. had not adapted yet. We were still producing um, huge, giant, gas-guzzling uh, cars in the United States, and the Japanese were producing small, fuel-efficient cars. And so uh, when those started to hit the U.S. markets, they were very popular. People all wanted these fuel-efficient cars. And so there were quotas set. Uh, we've also seen quotas set on, um, on goods like um, steel from Japan uh, because there were a lot of accusations that Japan was trying to drive our business, our producers in the United States out of business. Uh, basically, if we want it to be effective, it's got to be less. It's got to be restricting trade, making it less than it, it would be imported with free trade. Um, typically firms respond not too badly to this. 
when we put a quota on the Japanese cars that were coming in, that meant the Japanese got to charge more. You limit supply, price goes up. And so the Japanese weren't necessarily unhappy about um, this. I mean, they would like to have brought in more, but they did get to charge more for what they were bringing in. All right, um, we are going to skip all this history stuff that you see in your notes, all this history stuff. Y'all can look through that, but I am going to skip it and go right to the end of the chapter. And we're gonna talk about what some of the arguments over time have been for why we should have trade restrictions. And then I'm going to also give you the counter argument of why that's not necessarily a valid reason. All right, so, um, one of the oldest arguments is the national defense argument. And this argument says that some industries are so vital that if we were in a war and our supplies of this good were cut off, then we would be in trouble. So sugar is protected under the national defense argument. If we were to get into a war and we were unable to get sources of sugar from the rest of the world, we would be in serious trouble. They're not wrong about that. Um, but the problem with the national defense argument is there are some really silly goods that are protected under national defense. For example, wool fabric is protected under the national defense argument. Countries are restricted from importing too much wool into the United States because wool is so vital to our national defense. Do y'all know why wool is vital to our national defense? Do you have any idea why? No, nope. because dress uniforms in the military are made of wool. Oh my God, if we went to war, we couldn't have dress uniforms in the military. Really? That's ridiculous. As if we can't make those uniforms out of some other material. And how much do we really need the dress part of the dress uniform during the war? Um, so that's a lot of silly things end up being protected under national defense. All right, uh, the next one is the infant industry argument. And what this one is saying is we would like to encourage new industry in our country. Um, so if we're trying to encourage a new industry to develop in our country, we should protect it from foreign competition and give the baby time to grow. That makes sense. So, you know, we wanna encourage this industry. We want it in our country. For example, I, you know, I know that a lot of us wish that we were producing those um, microchips that we've been in such short supply with. Um, and this is an industry we'd like to encourage so we would protect them from foreign um, competition. The problem with the infant industry argument is when Congress comes and says, hey, we've been keeping an eye on y'all. Y'all are doing great. You've really grown and you're competitive. No, no, no. We still need protection. No, no, we, we, we really can't compete yet. So keep protecting us. So the babies never, the baby never grows up. The government um, never takes this protection away. And so that's a problem. All right, uh, the next one is one of my favorites. It's the anti-dumping argument. 
uh, dumping is the practice of selling a good overseas for less than you sell it at home. You sell a product overseas for less than you sell it at home. That's dumping. And then there's even worse, predatory dumping, which is selling a good in a foreign country for less than your cost. Predatory dumping, selling in a foreign country for less than your cost. And the whole point of dumping is to drive the domestic producers out of business. So when I talked about Japanese steel and our problems with it, dumping was one of the problems that we saw. The Japanese were selling the steel in the United States for less than they were selling it at home in Japan. And some were even accusing them of selling it for less than it cost. And again, the whole point was to drive the US steel industry out of business. Here's what an economist says to that one. Cheap steel, woo! Let's take that cheap steel while they're willing to give it to us. Oh, and they drove some of our, our businesses out. Well, as soon as they try to jack up prices, guess what? We'll go back in. As Soon as there's profit to be made, somebody will open the steel industry again. So we might as well enjoy the cheap steel while we can. That'd be the economist argument there. All right, the next one is jobs and income argument. We can't have free trade because we'll lose uh, jobs to the foreign countries we're trading with. This was the huge, huge argument we had with um, over NAFTA. People kept saying, we cannot have free trade with Mexico because Mexico will take our jobs. Yeah, and guess what happened? We opened up free trade with Mexico and Mexico took some of our jobs. It did happen, but here's the deal. It was gonna happen anyway. And what we're seeing is Mexico took the jobs because their workers would, could be paid less. Their workers could be paid less because they were worth less because they didn't have the education, the human capital, and they didn't have the physical capital to work with. So the Mexican workers at first were less productive. And so they didn't have to be paid as much as the US workers. Well, we've seen over time with NAFTA that um, the workers have gotten money. They've insisted on getting better educated children. They've been asking for better schools and better education for their children. Those companies are investing in capital equipment. The workers have gotten better and better at their jobs. They're getting more educated themselves. And over time, workers' skills and wages in Mexico have increased. In fact, wages in, in the Mexican border towns at the factories are the same as on the Texas side in those same factories. And guess what's happening to poor Mexico now? They're losing jobs to Bangladesh. It was gonna happen anyway. So you can make the argument, but when you're gonna lose jobs, you're gonna lose them anyway. All right, and the last one is the declining industry argument. This one's kind of the opposite of the infant industry. We got an industry that's dying. Um, you don't wanna let it all die at once because that would put a lot of workers out of work all at once. So instead we protect it and let it die a really slow, painful death. We're seeing that in the textile industry, clothes. We don't make clothes in the United States. We don't make fabric in the United States. We, that is definitely not our comparative advantage. 
but we don't want to put all the clothing workers out of business, out of work at once. And so we've been protecting that industry for like 30 years. We are all paying way more for our clothes because of the tariffs on the clothing that we buy. Um, and in fact, we're paying more for our clothes than the jobs are worth. If you looked at collectively how much extra we're paying for our clothing and compare it to how many jobs have been saved because we're paying extra, we're better off if we just fired those workers and gave them money than what we are right now. Okay. So we let it linger way too long. Guys, that is it for chapter 19. That is it for mini master 2022. We've covered a whole semester of economics in 11 days of class, 10 days of class. Where are we? We are on day 10, 10 days. And we covered an entire semester. I know that's crazy, isn't it? Um, so uh, we are done. Um, today, y'all have uh, your quiz four is due tonight at midnight. Um, and don't forget that you have the short answer part to go with it. And you also have homework due tonight. Um, if you've already done all of chapter two, you don't have to do anything. If you only did the ones you were supposed to do at the beginning, um, it's reopened for you for problems four through eight and chapter 10 is due tonight as well. Um, and then you can kind of enjoy a pretty good weekend because Monday is a holiday. Um, and so Tuesday, we, yeah, y'all did manage to learn all of it. I was telling my, um, uh, some friends, they were asking me how it was going. And I'm like, it is going insanely well that I have such a smart group of students and y'all are keeping up with everything and doing everything you're supposed to. And the grades are really good. So I've been so impressed with you guys. This has been one of the easiest mini masters I've ever had. Um, anyway, so Monday, um, no class. So it, take a couple of days off, enjoy yourself. Um, and then we can get back Tuesday. I'll only have office hours from 10 to 11 on Tuesday. So you only need to come join in class if you have questions. Um, and you don't have to come right at 10. If you come at 1030, that's okay if you have questions. Uh, and then Tuesday, you'll have your quiz five open. A uh, big warning there, it opens on Tuesday. It closes at noon the next day. So it's closing a little early because your final exam is opening. So I wanted y'all to get that homework done before the final exam opens, okay? And so the final exam is due June 2nd at midnight. Any questions? Um, I will see. I think I have a final exam review, um, but y'all know what to study. Y'all have been doing such a good job all, all semester. Um, I don't think I have any chapter one on the final. That's not a big help to you guys, but I don't think there's anything chapter one there. Um, so that gives you a little bit less. That's the nice thing about mini masters. You you know, it was only 10 days ago, 12 days ago that we were looking at chapter one and two. So it's not like it's been that long for you, anybody to forget anything. Okay, again, I'm so proud of you guys. Y'all have been working so hard. So at least take, you know, a day off over the weekend. Okay, I think I have a review that I will try to post. Usually what my review has is, um, it has bolded questions that might be short answer, but y'all won't have short answer. So I'll post the review and just ignore the bolded versus anything's fair game for uh, the multiple choice on the review. Um, and I'll try, I'll find it and try to email it to you guys instead of posting it. So all I've got left to do is uh, email you today's lecture and 
do some grading when uh, quiz four is turned in. Okay. So any questions, I'm here. Otherwise, um, I won't see you unless you come to office hours. Uh, it was a joy. Y'all were great. It's been a great summer. Bye, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful class, amazing class. Have a good one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>